So welcome everyone. So happy that you're able to join us today. Um, my name is Beth Berenger and I am the Director of Education Programs for Essex Heritage. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, um, all of Essex County, Massachusetts is a federally designated heritage area. And that's because it has so many wonderful historic and natural and cultural organizations and sites up here in Essex County. Um, and so our organization really tries to connect people with this area's history. Um, and so this program today is definitely an effort in that direction. Um, it's part, this is part of actually a larger series of um, workshops that we've been offering um, this past couple of years um, called Teaching Hidden Histories. This is the fifth in the series. Um, and we're very, very grateful to our, um, the, the grant that we got, uh, the National Park Service actually gave us some funding for this, um, this workshop today. Um, quick pop quiz, what are the two national parks in Essex County? Who knows? There are two national historic sites. Saugus Ironworks is one. Saugus Ironworks, Wendy, yes. And what's the other one? Salem Maritime. Salem Maritime, excellent, Danica. That's right. So um, we're we have an affiliation with the national parks, and we're we're very very grateful that we were able to get some funding through um, the national parks. So today we really want to have an interactive experience, so we'd love for you to keep your camera on, but we know that's not always possible. Um, if you could stay muted, except when you have a comment, um, or obviously when we go into breakout session, we'd love for you to do lots of talking. We always have that chat feature um, available if you'd like to communicate that way. Um, and I think there is some closed captioning. Um, Sherry, is that correct? That is correct. Wanted to just quickly introduce Sherry Grishin, my colleague at Essex Heritage. She's with us this morning as well. And hey, she, hello, and she's um, here to help us with anything with technology and so forth. So thank you so much, Sherry. Um, also want to introduce today, Brian Sheehy. Um, he is the um, North Andover High School History uh, Department Coordinator. And he really is the one that helped to kind of start this series and just wanted to give a little bit of time to telling you about that, Brian. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out today. Um, this really started um, during the pandemic when a group of my students reached out to me uh, with a very bold email that said action required. And they wanted me to overhaul all of our curriculum and, and you know, really to reflect a lot of the things they were seeing on their screens and, and things like that. Um, that's tough to do. This is a lot. Um, this is something that I, that I felt that um, teachers could take and start to incorporate and make those small incremental steps towards a change. So this whole program has, has really been a lot of fun to, to do. And I hope pieces of it have been useful for all of you and hope this will be useful as well. Thank you, Brian. We wanted to acknowledge today um, a, a really important resource for you. There is a guide that was um, developed, um, again, through a National Park Service grant, actually, that has been recently published all about the, the history of African Americans in our county. Um, and Dr. Cabria Baumgartner, who's with us today, was one of the principal investigators with this resource, along with um, Salem State Professor um, Liz Duplos Arcello. Um, and I took this quote actually from the introduction to that guide because I think it does really kind of get to the heart of some of the reasons why we feel this is so important. Um, and so we can kind of just take a minute here to, to check this out. Such work is essential, meaning this work, teaching these hidden histories for all residents to understand the rich history of the county and particularly important for black residents to see themselves, themselves represented consistently and centrally in the cultural institutions and museums in this region. And the larger project in many ways embodies the beauty of this national heritage area driven by community members, archivists, librarians, researchers, most of all our ancestors. And, um, you know, and I would add to that our teachers, um, our educators. And that's really what we, uh, you know, our intention today is to try to bring some of these amazing stories and difficult stories um, more to light and, and doing that uh, through how we're, how we're going to teach and interpret in our museums. 
So we're really trying to answer today um, this example of 19th and 20th century Black history, how it illuminates some of the stories that may have been hidden in our larger American history. Um, we're, we're using this term um, inclusive. I don't know if you have a presentation that was put together by Ruben Enriquez, who's from DESE, um, who's helping us try to think about how to be mindful of um, how we're going to be more inclusive and responsive and critical as we are teaching these histories. So we're sort of using that terminology as we think about how to approach this history. So again, being inclusive, and then in terms of being responsive, we need to help our students connect with this history. Um, and the, the reason why we're trying to go local is, is a big piece of that. We know that these local stories really tend to resonate with, with students. We wanna keep their voices and their ideas at the forefront of our teaching as well. And again, this is not easy, this is challenging. So we're here to support each other in doing it. We wanna create that safe environment for, for some difficult conversations. And these are very complex issues. Um, and really that's our intention today. We're gonna be looking at some exemplary stories of black people's experiences right in our region here that are gonna highlight some of these larger themes of exclusion, but also um, a pretty remarkable fight for access um, and opportunity that continues. And we're gonna look at a lot of primary sources. So grateful to everyone who has contributed sources for this project um, from the Lynn Museum to um, Phillips Library, um, to a graduate student at Northeastern, Zobeda Chapi Valdez, who's done a lot of work, and Brian Sheehy, who's done a great amount of work to bring these sources to us. Um, and we also wanna be thinking about contemporary voices in our community to help us think about how to teach. So our, our agenda today is really, we're almost done with this um, short welcome and introduction. Then we're gonna spend quite a bit of time, about 45 minutes um, with our panel um, and, uh, taking a look at, um, or just listening mostly to, to how these folks have really thought about these issues. Then we are going to be taking a look more at some of these sources in breakout rooms. Um, so we hope you can stay for that piece of our time together. We've put together some of the, the sources into themes. And so you'll be able to kind of check out some of the sources together. Again, trying to start that process of thinking about how to approach some of these stories um, with students or with the public. Uh, we do offer PDPs for this workshop if you um, develop an activity plan. So we'll go over that at the end of the um, session together. And we have an exciting um, summer offering for you, a free summer workshop that we'd love to um, talk to you about. Well, so we'll do that at the end. Thank you so much to um, partners, especially Lawrence History Center has um, really um, done an amazing amount of work compiling these sources and, and making them accessible. Lynn Museum, Lynn Arts, um, PBS X Museum, Phillips Library, Salem State University, and Haverhill Public Library, and many other archives in our region. And a special thank you to our contributors today. We have Brian Sheehy, who you met, um, and, and uh, obviously his students who kind of started this whole thing off. I'd also like to introduce Brad Austin from Salem State University. Brad, would you like to say hello? Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Brad is gonna be our moderator today. And so he'll be kind of um, uh, taking care of our panel in, in a few minutes when we get that started. We also have uh, Dr. Cabrera Baumgartner from Northeastern University. Um, Cabrera, would you like to say hello? Yes, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Good morning. And, and I'm not sure that Carrie Greenidge is able to join us this morning. Um, is Carrie here? Don't think so. Okay. And we also have Edward Carson from Governor's Academy. Edward? Good morning, people. Good morning. Good morning. And thrilled to have Danika Thurston from Lynn Museum here. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here. Hi, Danika. And we have Zobeda Chaffee Valdez, who's a graduate student at Northeastern University. Zobeda? Hi, good morning. Good morning. All right, so with that, we are gonna move into our panel discussion. Brad. Thanks, Beth, and thanks to everyone for being here. It's um. It's always a pleasure to work on these um, these sessions that I work on. I mean, just ride the coattails of Brian and Beth and Sherry and all the scholars. In some ways, it's um, it's you know, it's the joy of going back to grad school without the 
um, without the, the pain of writing the papers or in, in Edward's case, go back to grad school and go back to church. Um, uh, <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, and so, but also, so it's, there's the intellectual simulation of learning for me, but also as a teacher, this is um, the goal for these sessions. And what I found this one especially um, to realize is that this is really practical um, information and advice that um, I can take to my own classrooms, my specialized classes, my survey classes. And, um, you know, it's we're ending the end of semester here, but I'm already taking notes and figuring out how I can put notes in places where I'll see them next time I teach these classes to, to use this resource or make sure I do that. Um, and so I'm hoping that our participants um, um, can are feeling the same way and that we can build on what we've already learned from our, our panelists um, as we spend the next 40 uh, minutes or so in conversation with them. Um, so what I thought I could do is kind of take advice from um, Zubeda, who just wrote a fantastic presentation on how to do research. I just really, really appreciated that. That's one of the things I'm definitely going to take to my undergrad and grad research um, classes. But the idea of starting broad and, and kind of narrowing in a little bit um, makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, again, I love the advice of, yeah, some dead ends. That's what happens. If we have dead ends, we'll transition to another conversation. Um, and want to make sure that we incorporate the comments and questions that, um, that the participants have as well. Some were submitted beforehand, but want to invite you to um, just post questions in the chat um, if you, or, or just raise your hand and, and interrupt. This is a conversation. Let's just not interrupt, but just join the conversation um, and let's, let's make this be a free flowing conversation. But it's kind of my job to, to, get, it, um, to get it started, I think. Um, and so again, thinking broadly, uh, it's, it's pretty clear to me as a historian of 20th century United States history who teaches about sport, who teaches about race and gender and sexuality a lot, um, why this is important, um, to, these topics are important to, to, to include. I'm, I'm thinking though, based on our presentations um, and the kind of joint presentation we had with um, um, Danica and Kiria, um, Kiria began by telling her personal story of like what it meant to go to museum and to see kind of stories reflecting um, that where she saw herself reflected back um, and how important that was for her. And Danica, I wonder if you could begin a little bit telling us about Lynn's experience. Um, not only you said you talked a little bit about the motivation for doing this, about responding to school groups and others and and noticing that the students weren't reflected in the panels and um, and what the reaction, the community reaction has been to, to telling a more inclusive story. I think one of the most powerful things in all the presentations is your comment that, hey, um, you know, black history is land history. They're not separate, they're part of the same. Why aren't we telling this part? Um, which I think is, if we take nothing else from this, just that simple comment is worthwhile. But can you begin, do you mind beginning telling us a little bit about kind of Lynn's experience in and saying, hey, we need to do this and then experience having done it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I should say, I can't take all the credit for the work. Um, the, the project actually started um, for our Untold Stories, A History of Black People in Lynn. Um, it's an exhibition that we currently have on view. Um, the project started in 2016, 2017, um, conversations internally with staff, um, largely our education team, realizing, you know, as Bride mentioned, um, the students not connecting with the histories that we had on view or not seeing themselves reflected and sort of this disconnect. Um, and so we had decided that you know, it was high time that we start showcasing stories um, within our community that haven't really been seen or heard before. Um, but we recognize as a largely colonial institution, it's not our voice that needs to be heard at this, at this time. Um, so the, the institution reached out to the black community here in Lynn um, to form an exhibition committee uh, because we wanted this to be a community based exhibition, a community project and really promote and encourage community voices, uh, which led to um, not only the exhibition committee, um, but story share days, which were really fantastic. Um, we worked with our local access TV station to capture oral histories. Um, I will always promote local access TV stations. The memberships are so affordable um, and really are really rewarding. Um, in terms of what you can do uh, with your community, with your students, with your schools. Um, 
So we had a couple of days where we captured oral histories. Um, folks were able to bring in photographs, newspaper clippings, scrapbooks, artifacts um, from their history, from their family's history. And it was just really beautiful to capture and sort of see in addition to the material that we had within our collection, um, as well as you know the newspaper clippings um, from the Daily Item and a number of um, newspaper organizations that were here in the city, it was great to have sort of the community come together to really celebrate the story. Um, the exhibition committee, we did the research, uh, we wrote the labels, we installed all of the artifacts ourselves. You know, it was really a community effort to bring the exhibition together. And it's been a really positive response. Um, you know, we've been featured on Chronicle. Um, I had the opportunity to speak at the Cape Ann Museum and it's just been really wonderful to see the community come and learn about this incredible history that I myself as a Black Linner didn't know how extensive the Black history was in Lynn and also partnering with our school groups. Um, you know, similarly in Lynn, you know, the students are advocating for more inclusive history um, and more social justice to be taught in school. So it's been great to have groups come in and the students, you know, they see me, they see the staff, they see the exhibition, and they really feel this connection. Uh, most recently, we actually had a vendor, a new um, black owned business here in Lynn come in to do a project. And I had her go upstairs and the joy of seeing her come down the stairs to see herself reflected in our in our space was just it that's what it's all about yeah that that's so powerful and i'm glad you've had such um a positive experience with it i'm thinking most of us don't run museums right on this call most of us um are classroom teachers but i think the the lesson of it's it's a, almost a truism this one but the representation matters um and to connect it maybe we go to um, cabria in a second but you know, one of the documents from Salem State that I teach about is one of the documents that, that I think Cabria found and or has highlighted for us is the, the Valentine's Day Manifesto of the Black students at Salem State in the early 1970s. Just saying, just saying, we need, why aren't we learning about Black history? Why aren't we learning about Black literature? Why aren't we learning about, why do we have um, so few Black um, professors? All these things they're saying, um, you know, we can talk about what's happening in Salem and Lynn in the 1840s, we can talk about Salem in the 1970s, but also we can think about our classrooms now. And I think that's one of the reasons we're all here today is because we believe this and we want to, um, to, um, to make sure our students see themselves and see um, a complete and accurate um, history. So uh, Cabri, if I can use that as a transition to you, um, you know, I loved, loved, loved the way, just learning from you about these people um, you know, I, one of the things I do is I teach a college class at Salem High School, and they're the Fortin Scholars. They're named, uh, the whole program is named for Charlotte Fortin. And so at Salem State, we know something about her. I didn't know as much about uh, Sarah Ramond as, as until today, but what I really loved in thinking as a teacher is the way you highlighted not only their accomplishments in the court cases, but their, their friendship. And I wonder um, if you could say a couple of things about the but the ways as a scholar, you, you get to learn about these kind of intimate lives of people, but also as a teacher, how important it might be to talk about um, historical people as people with full, well-rounded, often complex lives. Yeah, that's, I think that's a, a really powerful question. Um, and I will say a lot of the work um, connected to the Black student movement at Salem State was um, a lot of that archival work was of course done by um, Susan Edwards and then um, Liz Duclos Orsello. She was um, the one sort of compiling that record. And I think in uh, Zobeda's presentation, she talks more about black student activism. And I think that's a very important part of um, yeah, the history of, of black students in Essex County. Um, so in my work, I'm a historian of the 19th century United States. Um, early African American history. My work is centered right here in the New England region. And I have been very interested in um, telling the stories of Black people, but as you said, in ways that are more well rounded, that are fuller and more inclusive, um, that understand you know, the, com the complexity uh, of what it means to be a human. And so that was really important to me in tracing the experiences of Sarah Parker Ramond and, and Charlotte Fortin. Um, and thinking about not just their own individual experiences, 
um, but also what it meant for them to develop this friendship really around education and intellectual culture. They were both fascinated um, by books and they both loved to read and they were passionate about anti-slavery. And that's really where their commonalities were. But I was also struck by the fact that they both had to deal with racism in public schools. Um, and even though there are about 20 years that separated them and their experience in public schools in Salem, they both still had to deal with it. Um, and so I think they relied on each other right, um, to, to sort of get through those, um, those moments. But that, that friendship to me, there's more, I think there's more to say about that friendship and it's really um, something we can see uh, in a lot of members of the black community. Well, that I'm thinking about my own teaching over the last week or two when, um, when as we all know, like current events have um, draft Supreme Court decisions and other things have, um, have raised a lot of questions that those of us are in the classroom, um, have, I, at least I felt obligated to address my students and talk to them. And one of my students um, at Salem High School was just saying, I, I can't believe, you know, I can't believe we're still dealing with this. It seems like we're going backwards. And the, um, and the notion of, so we had to talk about, you know, about how progress happens, like the, like how change happens and how it happened in the past and how it happens now and how there are, there are, um, ways that we can see as progress but then their setbacks and so we had talked um we talked with charlotte about charlotte fort and with those students we had talked to her about that about salem when the one of the reasons she came to salem was family connections one of the reasons was because salem had integrated public schools i had not realized so i watched your presentation that they had integrated public schools and they shut those things down um and then <laughs> then then through activism and litigation and, and friendships and personal connections um, they, they make changes and then try to make it statewide. And so just, um, I just wish I'd had that example in my back pocket a week ago, um, to give it, but it's such a powerful thing as we think about, um, as we're moving maybe the conversation a little bit to thinking about like what we teach and how we teach this stuff. It's like, sometimes it's, it's details. Salem Public Schools integrated in 1840, 1842, is it? Or, you know, something like this sort of thing happened, um, or reintegrated maybe. Um, but also it's about the broader contours of change and how it happens. Um, and, and so maybe a profitable use of our time right now would be to think about, about ways we teach about Black history in Essex County in our more traditional classes. Um, um, most of us don't have the luxury that Edward has of being able to offer, you know, um, an American Jesus class at a high school or something like that. Um, but we all have the opportunity to, to teach about these people and these ideas and these processes in our classes. But I wonder if Edward, if you could get us started thinking about, because I, I just was fascinated by your presentation, about um, ways in which your students kind of, you and your students connect these histories and these questions about race and sexuality and religion to, um, to the, the major, the, the major touchstones of the traditional historical narrative. All right, brother, thank you so much. You know, it was interesting and I'll start off by saying that, you know, traditionally I'm not from New England. I'm a brother born and raised in, in Montgomery, Alabama. Did my- Tennessee right here. What's that? Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee, okay, there we go. That's it, my friend, that's it. And so, you know, it was interesting. So when I, a lot of this started when I'm um, doing a lot of the work that I do, when I, when I made this journey up here, I started to really, you know, I teach at, you know, some of these prep schools, those Brook schools, I'm at the Governor's Academy, primarily an administrator these days, but I do keep, get a chance to teach some of these courses, and, and, and really talking to students about the dynamics of others, and what does othering mean, you know, I started to kind of get a, a greater sense, not only from students, but my colleagues that, you know, New England, surprisingly, was a little bit more traditional than I had anticipated when I migrated up here. I was a bit surprised. So I thought, well, if this is the case, I need to really create something that's going to really challenge the nomenclatures that we've created about how we think about history. And so I thought I, I reached out to this, this uh, Stephen um, Prothera. Um, he's a, um, um, he was down at um, Boston University and created this course in which we could talk about Let's talk about the role of white supremacy in religion and how does that play a role throughout the United States? Not only the role, of course, of, 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 of white supremacy in terms of the traditional KKK sense, but how do we talk about it in terms of linking it to 
the work of, of, of Martin Luther King Jr. when he was down at BU, for example. You know, one of the things that I do that I don't think I put in that video is, um, you know, a lot of my work that deals with black ideology and the rise of communism within the state of Massachusetts is, you know, I start linking the work, some of the earlier works of, of King, for example, even in, in Coretta Scott. And I remind folks in his classes, we're thinking about faith and ideology here, that it was Coretta Scott King that was farther to the left than, than Brother Martin Luther King. They, they, she had to move King. That brother was kind of middle class, had his own car, and, and, and Brother King was worried about, you know, how his, how his dad was going to feel when, when he met Coretta Scott King, right? So really kind of integrating some of these narratives in, into the fabric and kind of keeping it up to this area. Now, the other thing, too, was that I, I found it really interesting in linking things locally to the national issues, um, you know, going down to... Um, um, visiting um, um, Roxbury, for example, and talking about the legacy of Malcolm X. Uh, and, and a lot of folks really don't really grasp the impact he's had in this area. And again, keeping it at that national level, uh, but also trying to bring it down to this local level too. You know, and another thing I'll say is, you know, a lot of people have visited the African Meeting House down in Beacon Hill, right? And, and seeing what that looks like. So in this course, you know, the idea of course is, centering things on ways that we can, you know, if you can't create a course, as I mentioned in that video, like this, there's so many nuggets of narratives that you can plug in. Particularly, I found using popular culture to engage students in so many ways. You know, the examples I use, you know, I, 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 I pull clips from Family Guy, you know, elements and lyrics of, of rap artists in different ways and students are blown away when they can see social struggles uh, in that dimension. And, you know, and I don't have a lot of street cred because I haven't listened to rap music since, I don't know, the golden, the golden age, I guess that was 97. So I just kind of listened to the vinyls of my parents, but um, so I'm talking too much, but a lot, lot of, a lot of great, great, great elements um, that are found there. I feel like we should have a separate conversation on when the golden age of rap was. Um, <laughs> but may have to do that offline. Uh, uh, 97, uh, it's a good, good choice. The, um, I, I guess one of the things I really liked about what you said and what really moved me from your presentation was, as I'm thinking about, like, we, we're going we're gonna to talk about pop culture in a second. That's when I want to bring Brian in. But, you know, like the, big, the big themes of American history, one of them is, hey, religion matters. Um, and religion matters... I think a lot more religion and geography. Someone told me one time and it stuck with me that religion and geography are the two things that mattered the most that we talk about the least, right? Like soil composition. We talk about, we talk about, um, you know, the founding of, um, of certain, you know, European based colonies. But at that point we, we kind of stop. but you know, climate matters. Um, soil matters. Religion really matters. And the way you were talking about, um, like really challenging, I, I forgot the, that, I have to quote here somewhere from you. Um, um, free inquiry and just let's just let's deal with this um, about the role of religion in both the pursuit of rights and greater equality and the rejection of rights and greater resistance to that advancement is such a powerful thing for us to our students to grapple with um, and I, I love that you use pop culture and a lot of different um, different ways to get at that um, I wonder Brian if we could talk to you a little bit about hear from you about um, about the um, about the use of sports and your own experience as a teacher uh, in culture to to dig into some of these these big issues, uh, whether it's it's you know, it's the, the research skills that uh, Cabrillas telling us about, or it's the um, some content or some like kind of essential understandings that you want your students to have. I think um, using pop culture, using sports examples are a great way to connect with your students. Mm -hmm. I think um, they can relate to those kind of things. They can understand and connect with sports. They can understand and connect with, with pop culture. And you could use those examples to facilitate um, critical media literacy. Uh, a lot of the stuff that was in my presentation um, dealt with with imagery in newspapers and how people are portrayed, and you could use those like those examples to kind of get people or you get your students to examine critically 
what they're seeing in newspapers, what they're seeing in magazines, and, and kind of get those those critical thinking skills that we that we want as educators. Um, I think using the sports themes is a is a great way to connect and using the local angle. I mean, a lot of times when we're when we want to use sports in the classroom, we're, we're like I said in my presentation, we're talking about some of the big people like Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali. I think there's a lot of local examples, too. And as I was going through this process of, of pulling sources and finding sources on Essex County, I, I found all these really rich examples of um of from like around here of Negro League uh, games of um, people who were who were kind of trailblazers in in like like in their sport. So um, there's there's definitely ways of using sport and there's definitely ways of using sport from the local angle. And so I think that's one of the the guiding principles of this this series of hidden histories is that local matters, right? If um, you know, if we go back to the notion of representation matters, right? Of being able to see yourself reflected in the in the course materials, in the museum exhibits, in the and the discussions you're having, and it's not just um, you know I, I make references that my students don't get to the um, to the 80s and, and 90s of the the extra special episode of you know when family ties when oh so suddenly we're talking about alcoholism you know for for an episode and then we go back to you know Zadie hijinks but it's not too often I'm afraid that's that's the way um, when we talk about when teachers or classes or students um, are exposed to African-American history it's and now we're gonna talk about black history for this one day or you know you have nine days of something and then there were women too and then it's back um, I think the our goal should be my goal as a teacher is to to try to just include all of the stories as part of the stories of 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 American history the the challenge is and so there maybe we'll come back and talk about some of the big themes here um that I want to touch on but I think that might be a, a segue uh, to talk to Cabrillo a little bit about like okay so how do we do this I mean we we can want to do this we're giving up part of a beautiful Saturday morning to talk to each other about doing this but there's the there's the kind of the the knowledge acquisition, the learning the content ourselves and becoming comfortable enough with that and seeing the connections. And then there's the, um, the how do we do it in the classroom, both in terms of classroom practice, but also in these climates, um, you know, maybe justifying to a school committee or to, um, to someone who's, who's writing letters to the principal. So I think those are conversations I'll make sure we have a chance to have. And I know we have some questions from students there. But I was wondering if Cabria could talk to some, I just thought that was such a great presentation on how to do research. The idea that you don't know what questions you have until you start asking really broadly and doing you know, literal searches. Um, but as teachers, we don't have a lot of time to do some of that, um, to get ourselves up to speed. Um, but Cabria, can we talk a little bit about, your, um, about just the research process and trying to uncover these um, hidden histories in, in this area. Um, sure, I, I think I'm gonna defer to Zobeda who's done a lot of that, that research and has a wonderful uh, student perspective um, as well. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna- I'm sorry, I had, I had my notes are wrong. I'm wrong. Yes, please, Zobeda. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's what I meant to do, I'm sorry. Um. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. It was really long worded and, and named it the wrong person. It turns out. No, I, I just thought your presentation on how to do research and how to the kind of philosophical approach of casting a net broadly and then seeing where it takes you was, was just really powerful. And I wondered if you just had um, some words of advice, perhaps, to those of us who are trying to get up to speed on a lot of different topics. Um, um, and just, the, you know. Yeah. Great. I mean, How, what's your advice? I guess my advice is that I think students, especially high school students in, you know, 11th and 12th grade have a lot of um, skills. And I think that they can be like very, very capable of doing a lot of this research on their own. And I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, as an educator, being there to provide guidance and being able to provide if you have the chance, you know, assignments that allow students to kind of 
stretch their skills in that way and conduct some of their own original research. I think my presentation was really aimed um, towards students themselves, late high school and early college, and you know, just giving general tips of advice um, on how to kind of narrow down a topic because so many times I've had assignments that are um, much like the, the one that I started out with here is, you know, we have, we're looking into black history in the 20th century in Essex County, um, but we're not sure exactly what uh, themes are gonna come out of that and, you know, follow your own interests, but also see what materials you find and let um, the sources themselves guide you in that research. And I think that can be very valuable. Um, I, one of the earliest mistakes I made in college was just being too set on an idea um, and too married to a thesis that I had or to a goal that I had and not um, allowing that kind of flexibility. Um, so, you know, being kind of loosey-goosey about it and finding names that come up and, uh, you know, random mentions in newspapers. Um, and the other thing I, I thought was, uh, you know, so many of the sources that I ended up finding were created by students themselves. And I think that can be really powerful, student newspapers and yearbooks and showing them that they can, you know, do this organizing, this activism and conduct the research and produce the primary sources, um, I think can be very empowering. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned yearbooks because I've I've often bookmarked that I think it's the internet archive page that has Salem State yearbooks and left a note, hey, Brad, come back to this, you know, come back to this in the 20s, come back to this later on. And I, and I haven't always done it. Uh, but what you said is, is so powerful is that the idea that students like learning about other students, they like learning about young people, they like learning about, um, you know, these people who were, who were challenged, but who had, as we say, who had friendships and friendships helped them figure it out. You know, this is, it's, it's how history happens. Um, and what I really liked about your presentation was that it's exactly the kind of thing I could show to my high school and my college students to help them do it. But also as a teacher who hasn't done all of the work you've done um, and the other teachers on the call probably haven't either. I, I feel like I, I know how to, based on your presentation, I feel like I could design a, a more open into research assignment and send my students to these places to ask questions in these ways um, without having all the answers myself. Because I think that's one of the challenges for us who want to, um, to elevate stories that aren't traditionally told is that we feel like we have to be masters of them ourselves. And sometimes it's just, no, let's, let's try to figure this out together. Um, and that's just, uh, the tool you gave us was, was fantastic for that. And I just appreciate it. Um, and so Beth, I'm not watching the chat. I can't. So if, you, if there are things I need to, to we need to hear, um, please, I see the numbers going up a little, please um, just jump in. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So far, no no questions, just very positive comments. Oh, good, good. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, Wendy, Wendy has a question, Brad. Wendy, what's your question, Wendy? Yeah, so um, I, I realize that this is a, a, a tailored question, but I, I recently had my students research um, their choice of theme in Civil War photography. And as we all know, there are um, exhaustive <laughs> um, amounts of, of Civil War photographs and um, primary sources. You know, I did let them use um, letters or drawings or, you know, things that were in newspapers. But, um, and this is a 10th grade, you know, US 1 survey class. And I guess my question is, um, I had a number of students that, you know, they'd pick a topic like medicine in the Civil War. And they would spend, I don't know, probably two minutes and go, oh, there's nothing there. Um, and I, I guess, you know, as a teacher, I, I I struggle at times with the survey class. You know, we, we have to get to the progressive era and we have to, you know, we have to, we have the interruptions of MCAS and, you know, we have a rotating, right? Like all those schedule things. And I want to foster authentic research and I want students to you know, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, but, but in this sort of instantaneous world, they, they like gave up in the Library of Congress archives or the other, you know, I gave them maybe 10 different places they could look and I gave recommended keywords and, you know, all of that. And, and yet there's, you know, they, they went right to Google. I'm like, you're not allowed to use Google. You have to use an archive. So I, I guess, does anybody have 
uh, additional thoughts, strategies, something where, you know, we, we want to do pointed research and, you know, obviously a survey class might be different than a junior senior elective or something where you have more time, but I guess I, anyway, um, does that all make sense? Like I, they expected instant results. I wanted them to look and, you know, not like struggle, but I wanted them to, you know, go through a process and they just, it, it was like, they either didn't know or didn't want like some learned helplessness perhaps, but yet also some lack of skill and maturity. I, I don't know. So any thoughts or recommendations? Can I respond to that briefly? Um, you working closely, and I assume you do this with your librarians, maybe constructing a lib guide on a topic um, that has some yeah. of the major databases and stuff that gives them a little focus in terms of the resources and everything could be yeah, quite we, helpful. We had one actually. So that, you know, we, we did that and, and they had the lib guide, but I, I mean, it, it was like shocking to me how, how instantly so many kids gave up and how they, they, anyway, I, I, I don't know how we can, foster that or you know what you know what else um, we can do I, I probably had almost too many options in the lib guide because they uh, you know and I guided them to you know pick this one or this one and even alphabetical they're like I can't find my topic I'm like you need to try more words you know so it, it was just interesting and and an unanticipated additional struggle than than prior years so I I just yeah thank you though Edward that that is definitely a, a good place to start other ideas? I might also suggest, um, just because I'm in Lynn, we have a GAR museum um, that's dedicated to Civil War history specifically in Lynn. So I don't know um, if maybe there's a similar resource in your community um, where I know some youth don't like to pick up the phone and make a phone call, uh, but perhaps send an email and reach out or maybe even visit and ask the questions in person um, or see some examples of you know, primary sources that they can use. Yeah, just to piggyback off that, I know when I've taken or or done different things with like the Lawrence History Center or the North Andover Historical Society, just bringing the kids in or kind of having an introduction to them to the hands-on type of stuff, I think that that, that kind of becomes more tangible. Um, so I, I definitely think that connecting with a local organization, whether it be in person or a lot of like a lot of um, different organizations are, are willing to zoom in and stuff now too. So you could kind of give that, hey, if you guys have anything on the Civil War, could you do like a mini zoom in and this is some of the stuff that we have just to kind of spark some interest because um, I think tangible objects are, are a great way to connect with students. Thank you, everyone. I, I have just one plug. I'm a big advocate for uh, National History Day. And I think that's a way that gives very clear guidelines about what research is like and what might be expected. And it connects students with kind of a little broader uh, perspective of other people, other students go through this whole thing too. So it's not just an assignment in my class. And again, that's where, thank you so much for that, Bruce. That's where I think Zabeda's, um, I look, I searched this, I searched this. If I wanted this in the base state, then I had to put resident in, and that gave me these names, like the, the kind of iterative feedback loop. I just think even at that five minute clip or so of that presentation was just, it was outstanding. It was really, really good. And for my mind, um, or my experience is, oftentimes I wanna give them all the options and they're better off with two. Um, you know, use this database or this database or use this database to do that. Um, you know, I think one of the things we, we struggle with as in, in these sessions is we find all these materials and want to share them all. But at the end of the day, part of what we're going to doing is saying, okay, look, you've got these 70 resources, which three would you really think could be best useful in your class, most useful in your classroom? Because look, we don't have time to go back through and read all those PDFs about, about barbers in Lawrence in the early 1900s. So, you know, what are, we don't, so I think being a little more, my I need to, I know at least I need to be a little more um, direct sometimes and give them fewer options um, and just let them experience, it's a goal is let them just experience the, the joys of research um, and the challenges of research. Um, telling them that dead ends are okay, they happen, we just have to recircle back, I think is really valuable. Um, what, um, 
what I'd like to do, oh, I see someone has a, um, Lucy, do you mind to share? Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, share that. We've got um, Historic Beverly. We did a program with the um, Beverly Middle School a few years ago, and we took like copies of our primary resources and took them into the classroom and let them, and they were like scans. So they looked pretty much pretty authentic and let the kids go through those, look at them. And there were like three of us, um, myself, someone from the parks, um, from the, from the um, park service. I think, wasn't there someone from Essex Heritage also, Beth, that was involved with that? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, we, had, and we had the kids and we had like, we actually have a lot of stuff on one particular enslaved or informally enslaved family in um, Beverly, the Larkham family, the um, Juno Larkham and her family. And so we had a lot of stuff on that along with other stuff that wasn't directly related to her class. And the kids seemed to really get into looking at this, these different primary sources. So that's an option um, to consider is getting, finding some, see if some organization has that capability. Um, we'd be happy to do it of course as well. Um, but ours is mostly focused on Beverly and it would probably be better if you had like your local historical institution to do something similar. But I'd be help, happy to help them kind of work out how to do that. These are all great suggestions. Um, thank you very much, Wendy. I, I, I'd like it if we can, during our last kind of 10 minutes of this session, pivot a little bit to a question that Gregory raised as a teacher um, and frankly that I raised as a school committee member in my town with a to a history curriculum presentation in our meeting this week is look which the elephant in the room is the this is a climate in which history curriculum is being scrutinized much more closely than it ever has been before and just at the moment and perhaps because we're at the moment when it seems that um more and more educators are actively seeking out ways to talk about about race and to talk about in really important ways and talk about the complexity of the American kind of quest for democracy, that, um, that curriculum materials, actual lesson plans, um, you know, there's Freedom of Information Act's um, requests going in across Massachusetts and across the country for, um, for, you know, materials and lessons and these sorts of things. I wonder if we can talk as a group, but give our panelists maybe the first chance to give us some advice about how do we, how do we, how do we explain to our administrators, to our community, to our parents, that this is exactly what we should be doing um, and this is why we're doing it? Is there, um, you know, Gregory had written, is there, is there a template? But we're not gonna, we're not gonna draft a letter here. Is, is there a language that, that y'all would suggest for, um, for explaining the importance of doing this kind of work in our classrooms? And I'll just open the floor. I've got my own ideas. But I'll open the floor to the panelists first, or then just the participants. That, you know how you're dealing with this. If you've dealt with this, um, these critiques and questions, and if so, how are we dealing with it? Do you want yeah, to start? I'll, yeah, I'll just say something quickly. Um, and again, I do have a couple of luxuries in terms of the institution that I'm at, so I do want to preference um, that. Uh, so at the school I'm at, I'm, I do DEI as a senior administrator here. I teach courses on, I'm teaching a seminar now on race, class, and gender. Um, in my institution, it's not much of a secret that I'm the former chair of the Communist Party of Massachusetts and all of the work that I do, right? So it's kind of a walking target. But one of the, it, but one of the things we've done to really address those things is the fact that we are mission driven. And, and that's the, the key thing. We don't draft up any lofty documents saying this is why we do it. We're mission driven in the sense that we create a free form of inquiry in which we invite all voices to engage in complex topics that formulate narratives that have excluded voices. And we let folks do know that we create a lot of forms in which we allow students to lead these conversations uh, in a very Socratic way. Um, you know, in, in which we've given them content and information too, you know, so I can say in my nine years here in Massachusetts, because of that, and who I am, and what I write about and lecture about and everything, I've not once been accused of anything. Uh, I'm very, very clear in my classroom that, you know, that we are going to engage in these discussions. And this is, we teach these things, because often they're absent, and 
I remind folks too that we're engaged in the business of education, not politics. And a lot of these things are circulated by political narratives beyond our control. See a lot of head nods, Edward. Thank you for that. Who else wants to chime in? Help us figure this out. Go ahead. Um, also just chime in to say, to empower your students and their voices. They're the most powerful voices that need to be heard and they should be given the tools to advocate for themselves. Um, I know we have a new independent school here um, that's focusing largely on history and education that supports black and brown children because that's those are the children that are going to the school um, and really empowering the students to advocate for themselves and what they want to learn. Um, so I think as educators creating space where they can meet with staff and faculty with the school committee or even holding a forum as Edward mentioned, to voice what it is that they want to learn about and why the, what they're currently learning is problematic for them and how they're not reflected in these teachings is the most powerful tool. I was, as a member of the school committee, I would say one of the most powerful things I've done is just go sit with the high school DEI committee um, and sit with the students and, um, and just listen and just listen and, um, and use that conversation to talk to the superintendent, to talk to the curriculum director, to talk with um, in public forums and private forums about, hey, we've got to be, we need to keep pushing on this. We have to keep doing it. Um, and so those of you who are in schools and who may be doing some of this work, um, I'd encourage you to try to, you know, that that's, a, it was a valuable use of my time. And I think the students appreciated having a school committee member um, join them. So that's the kind of thing your, your students could reach out um, and do. Um, other thoughts here? Beth, I'm gonna put you in the spot. Um, not Beth Berenger, Beth Ballou. Um, the, you're a curriculum director at a at the low. And what? So one of the questions is, to what degree? I think I think a lot of parents who are, if the ones who might be inclined to be a critical or, or, or look side eyes at some of this work, um, kind of understand at the high school level. Um, you know, it's part of the curriculum. The frameworks, Massachusetts frameworks, give us a lot of. Um, instructions um, to include these topics. At the elementary level, it may be, uh, or middle school level, it may be more problematic to quote unquote, talk about race um, with students. Beth, this is something I know y'all thought some about in Salem. Um, can you tell us a little bit what you've been doing? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of um, tension around teaching social studies. Mm -hmm. It both from a perspective of the content that we're challenged to teach and, and um, compelled to teach. Anna Nuncio, though, has been also in Salem, a school committee member who's really supported social studies and teaching towards, um, towards equity and inclusion in all ways. So we really appreciate those voices that choose to be part of our school committees to um, give teachers support um, so that they know that they've got backup when they choose to, um, to do what's right and reflect the, their student body and the histories that um, that have shaped this country that haven't been included in our textbook companies. Mm -hmm. So, um, so in Salem, we've really embraced hidden histories for elementary students. Uh, I mean, uh, histories mysteries mm -hmm. um, for elementary students that really put inquiry at the center, which is I think what um, uh, Edward was talking about, having to do with really making student questions and analysis from kindergarten all the way up really important so that they know that they can critically examine and speak back to sources and all the different points of view that might be embedded in those sources. Um, so we're trying to build that in and it's hard to find time in the curriculum in the, in the, in the day for social studies at the elementary level. In Salem, we're also using the DESI pilot uh, curriculum investigating history, which is helping us to do um, the whole world for ancient and medieval civilizations and societies so that students are getting to see a broader interpretation of history um, that really does not exist within the textbook um, companies and publications that are available for middle school students. So, um, so those are some of the ways. We really haven't had a whole lot of pushback. I have to say my ELA um, folks, they get a lot more critiques about the texts that they're choosing for um, students to read. <clears throat> but um, when it comes to social studies, Salem has really advocated uh, a more diverse 
perspective than maybe some of our neighbors. We're, we teach critical literacy, the ability to critique what we're reading, viewing, and consuming in all kinds of media. Thank you, Beth. Marianne, I see you have your hand raised. Marianne, did you? But okay, Anna, let's go to you, please. Yes, I wanted to thank Beth for mentioning this. Um, as a former school committee member, we did have in my course of serving four years, uh, towards the end of my term, a, a group of parents who attended a school committee meeting and expressed their huge, um, essentially they were expressing their huge fear of what they called critical race theory. And the superintendent very calmly explained, that's not what we're doing. We even had a handout from DESE that was distributed in the schools. Um, and although if I, we never did a, a, a poll of our school committee, we didn't talk amongst ourselves before the meeting or after about it. But if you, in looking back, I could tell that most of my colleagues on that school board, school committee were um, very certain and calm about what was really being going on in the schools. And we were very careful taking the lead from Drs. Reich, our superintendent, um, not to appear dismissive or scornful mm -hmm. about what the parents were saying. They had their say, and we could tell that they, I, I don't know how, what made me think this, but that they were communicating with each other to you, you go next, this is what you say. So it's largely driven by fear. And uh, when they do show up, when parents do show up at uh, school committee uh, meetings and express this unease, it's all driven by fear. And it was encapsulated in the phrase of one parent who said, you are teaching our children to hate each other. Before that, before they started learning this history, they, they, they didn't feel this way. You know, they didn't uh, hate each other. And in Salem, that is really problematic. Um, and in retrospect, I think now it's really important when you find it, not, well, of course, we wouldn't counter back. We're not allowed to do that. We're not going to engage in this back and forth with people during the public comment period. They get to say what they want. And then you can, if you want to, as a school committee member, come back to it at the end um, and, and mention it very generally, what you want to say about something. But in that moment, you're not going to engage in a debate with the parents, right? Um, but I think to understand and be very calm and respectful while they're saying, no matter how sometimes abominable you privately think, oh my God, what they're saying is just not right. Um, but there was a consensus, I think, unstated among the, the committee members then that, that felt like uh, we're gonna listen, but we're not going back. We're not going to say that we're not going to do this anymore. You know, uh, that was very important. So the tone you set of calmness. On the other hand, with regard to our Latino students in the schools, and and I'm sure African American students, I feel that we have to find a way to state that there is this fierce urgency of now, right? That phrase by Dr. Martin Luther King, where you must talk about these things. As teachers, you need to go there. And, um, and who knows where it starts? I think it starts very early in life where you see these things playing out in, in a child's life. So th those are my two cents of the school committee uh, perspective that we have to not be afraid. School committee mem members are not afraid uh, and they need to set a tone of um, respectful listening. It's not fake. Uh, but to see that fear and to really feel for that parent. It's um, that, that's so, so useful. Um, I'm, their fierce urgency and now maybe to move to the next part of the agenda in part. Um, but so um, I, I guess I would, um, Hassan Jeffries is someone um, who speaks on these topics a lot. He's a professor of history at Ohio State um, and um, a really great historian on the American Civil Rights Movement and is authored um, edited a book on understanding teaching the civil rights movement that I highly recommend to everyone. <clears throat> but one of the things he says is that the, the easiest justification is that, yeah, this is what happened, right? You know, 
yeah, Salem had Salem schools admitted black students, a whole family of them. And then they said, no, a uh, petition led by, I think it's 175 people. So I said, no, we don't want this. And then the school committee moved. It, and then, you know, talking about this history, it's not, it's what happened. And we owe our students an accurate history. Um, and if that makes them uncomfortable, yeah, there's a lot in history we should be uncomfortable about. Um, and that's okay, as long as we have the classroom environment where it's it's based on inquiry, it's based on on looking at um, its primary sources, all these things. But ultimately, whenever I fear foot um, pushback, it's that, yeah, this happened. Um, I know what I'm talking about. I, it's a, it's related to the, the broad themes that we're supposed to be teaching. It's related to specific frameworks we're supposed to be teaching. Um, and I'm happy to have a conversation, but you know, you know, if the truth is on our side, um, and then this has always been uh, a multiracial, multicultural, multiculturally religious um, community um, in the United States from, or the British colonies. And we shouldn't be afraid to say that and to bring all those voices up. Um, I'm looking at the clock, I, we need to move on. Thank you so much for this part of the conversation. I think Beth um, and Sherry are about to explain what's happened next. But now we're, we're, I think we're, this, we'll build on this and look at particular sources. Okay, now how can I use this to help tell those stories? So thanks everyone. Beth, all yours. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Um, just really, really invaluable presentations. And then also this discussion uh, I have found really, really illuminating. So thank you. And also to um, all of our participants for joining in the conversation, um, helping so much. Really, what we're trying to do here is support each other. And, and, and we've really um, you know, made that happen this morning, so we appreciate it. And we're going to continue that support right now in a bit of a different way. We've set up some breakout rooms for you and also a way for us to examine some of the sources that have been compiled. Um, hopefully you had a chance, um, maybe you had a chance to take a look at the website that we've been putting together. Um, special kudos to Zobeda and to Sherry for helping with that. Um, if you haven't had a chance, that's totally fine. The, the website will be up and, and is lasting for you to go back to and to look at, but we're, we thought it would be nice to just take a look at some of the sources together while we've got this kind of top of mind and this discussion is going. So the way that we're going to do it is we've set up a slideshow um, to help us as we're getting into breakout rooms. So I'm going to, in the chat right now, put a link to that slideshow. It's an editable slideshow where uh, you are going to actually focus on the slide that corresponds with your breakout room number. So I'm gonna just, that's the, the slideshow. If you could grab that off of the chat right now and just um, get that link. And then I'm gonna share my screen very briefly just to kind of give you a sense of what you're gonna see as you go to the link. <laughs> so you're gonna find a slideshow here and um, if you are in group one, for example, you're going to go to slide number one and you'll see um, where you can put your names of the people in your group. And then there is an, a place here for you to click on a link. And that link is going to bring you to a Google Doc where you can see some sources. They're going to be links to sources in a particular um, theme. And so this theme is looks like it's all about Salem State College and Black student activism. Um, there are probably too many sources for you to look at, so you might just want to pick a couple to discuss. And you do that by going to the link here within the, within the document you can see, so it all kind of flows. And you can take a look at some of these sources and discuss them together. We have a couple of questions for you to consider if you would like to consider those questions. You also, um, I'll just say, you don't even need to look at the sources. If, if your group decides you wanna just sort of continue the conversation in a different way, um, please, by all means, just do that. But again, this is just a chance for us to continue the discussion and, and focus maybe a little bit more on some of the sources. Um, do you have any questions about what we'll be doing for the next about half an hour in a small group? Can I just suggest that they do look at the sources just a little bit? Because these are great sources that um, people, spend a lot of time finding and like there are nuggets in there you can all of us can figure out ways to plug into our teaching even if you don't do it now but to if you focus on continuing the conversation these are worth coming back to yes thank you does anyone have any questions 
Okay, excellent. So I think Sherry is going to send us out into our breakout rooms. We'll see you in about half an hour. I meant to say too that, yes, the slides were editable, the Google Docs were editable. If you wanted to jot down any notes, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, sometimes like, you know, in the moment, it's good to just capture what it is that you've been thinking about um, so that when you, you know, refer back to the, the website, you've got some notes there. Anyway, um, would anyone like to, to share a little bit about their discussion? I can share for, uh, we were group one. Um, it was Diane, Amita, Sarah, and myself. And um, we, we had uh, an overwhelming amount of documents for our short time together. So we picked one that kind of captured our, our attention. Um, and, and it was one of those that I, I don't know, I let the title <laughs> kind of um, clue us in. So it was derogatory remarks lead to call for teachers removal. And it sounded all too familiar from, uh, I'm sure, some stories that we've all heard, you know, I, I mean, really kind of all the time, um, but also, you know, I think especially with things like CRT and, and all of that coming up um, more recently. So, you know, we read through it, we were horrified at, at just the overt racism that was in, um, you know, the teacher's remarks about like, how I, you know, I wouldn't expect you to get this right, black girl from the ghetto, and I mean, just like very ob obvious um, and overt um, racist remarks. And so, you know, obviously we could link that with like a news story today to to sort of look at, you know, how far have we come, but yet how not far, you know, if we're thinking of some of those conversations. But then we sort of delved into. Um, you know, how easy it is to sort of pat yourself on the back for not doing these things. And, and again, it's so easy to, um, to like not do overt racist things, but what about our implicit and unconscious biases, especially, um, we went into a conversation about like leveling, um, this time of year, we're recommending kids for AP classes or honors classes. And, um, especially as demographics in, like public schools shift um, and you know typically there's like grade requirements or performance requirements that you know people are thinking about and making these recommendations but um, you know what are we assuming about students or student populations what sort of unconsciously like are we recommending fewer students of color for higher level classes and that that's an unconscious you know decision and how can we be aware of um, you know, equitably um, recommending students, but then also considering, um, you know, I was mentioning my, my lowest level sophomore class is um, predominantly students of color and wondering, you know, okay, so freshman year, they, they were recommended for the lower level history for sophomore year. And it is maybe a stretch in theory to ask some students to take AP if they were in CP, but you know, what caused them to be in CP this year in the first place? And was there something that was maybe missed or maybe they had a one-off year or, um, you know, whatever it is and, and like not letting sort of that systemic process continue. Like how can we, um, I don't know, how can we approach that whole thing? Um, and then Sarah had mentioned too of, um, you know, as schools, rethinking or reminding ourselves of what our goal with AP is? Is it just the top scores or is it also exposure? Mm -hmm. And if it's exposure, then also getting the community on board that if, you know, tons of students are taking AP classes so that they get the challenge within the, the supportive environment of high school with teachers and study halls and academic support and routine, then the school and admi administration need to be on board that maybe the scores won't look as good but there's a different goal in place. So anyway, I think that summarizes our, our conversation. We didn't really have answers. We just, you know, we're sort of grappling with, with these concepts. Well, as we discussed before, and I think, um, I think Edward was reminding us that sometimes just asking the question and learning how to ask the questions is, is, is one of the most important things we can do. Um, so, so thanks for that. I, I do have one question for those of you who use sources um, such as the one you described and the one I've looked at too from about Salem State. It's, and again, think about the climate we're, we're in. Um, does anybody have any advice about how to use sources that accurately reflect the past, but that include language like 
like that. Like I couldn't expect in this case, it's, it doesn't use any of the so-called go words, but it's the, um, you know, you, you black girl from the ghetto. Is, is that, how do we introduce, is there a, a good way to introduce those or to frame them so we can use them in our classes or is it improper to, to use sources with that kind of language or much worse language in our classes? Um, as we think about the importance of doing this, we have to deal with the fact that there's a lot of really racist crap out there um, from the past that we, we might want, we want to expose our students to the existence of these ideas, but sometimes the, using the language is um, really problematic and challenging. Um, you know, I'll just say I, I, um, I, oftentimes I do start things off with a bit of a trigger warning for students, and I like to contextualize the narrative that's going to be in place in terms of the language we use. Um, I, I, you know, not all students, we have a number of international students um, who travel from around the world to our country. And so, for example, you know, there was an incident a couple of years ago where an international student used the N-word. Um, and not in my class, but another, and, and that was on the teacher for not contextualizing, making folks aware of what's permitted and what's not permitted. I have a student who's doing research on white migrants from Scotland to the, the, the American South, and he calls it cracker culture. And, you know, and the thing I told him is that term cracker, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a racial appetite and derogatory. And so there's got to be context around that, too. Uh, for people to understand. So I, I think though for me, those things have been helpful and they've um, allowed for rich conversations without discomfort. And there's some words we just don't say yeah. at all. We just pass over and we know what those words are. Right. Gregory, I see you have your hand raised. It was actually um, for, for the group, uh, for group three to go okay. next, but I can actually, uh, no, well, quickly yeah. just to, Oh, no, the same thing contextualized. And I know, um, for example, in my African American history course, if we, um, if niggers brought, brought up at all, and we're going to look at text and, and I get into it. And as far as uh, uh, I heard Edward talk about uh, just hip hop culture in general and talk about golden age and um, suggested time periods, but I grew up during the same time period. And, and I try to tell them about the different arguments people try to make, but contextualize and the fact that it still has the sting and this is why. And there's some things that were out there. I mean, it might be a little bit dated, but I know the Washington Post had a big thing and it was interesting that Colin Kaepernick's name was actually drawn, in, um, was, it was there before the kneeling because I think it was about N-word being used on the field and it would be a punishment or something like a penalty. So Washington Post actually did something where they um, had some short videos and conversations about it. So there's things out there to kind of spark the conversation. I know Ta-Nehisi Coates has, has a good talk when um, he was on, I think it's a, a Vox clip where it's just very, it's, it's well done. And it would have to be something definitely you talk to admin, try to get that and let, let people know um, good point about the trigger warnings, but kind of puts us in a, in a place where we kind of facilitate because sometimes I know it's hard for teachers to even feel like to want to repeat the word or but I'm in a comfort zone where I'll hear it in the class and I'll tell students I know you're not saying it like the person that would probably want to lynch me and my family I know you might be saying it but let's look at it this way when I'll hear the term and I they'll say well yeah different mistakes with term of endearment so I have such a I'm so time unfiltered with classes, but it's a comfort zone that I've had for the 20 plus years I've, I've been in there to feel um, enough to kind of get that teachable moment going in a specific way, but in a responsible way also. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I see there are a lot of um, notes. We may have to put Beth on the spot here again in a second, but can you tell us, um, Gregory, about what y'all talked about in group three? Um, I, I, we were such a nice eclectic group. Um, Jacqueline, who's going to be starting on a career, uh, Luz was so great saying, I'm just sitting here, not as an educator. And then Anna, I want to put on the spot because we actually had a nice lesson. I'm um, just taking a step back and looking at Belinda's petition, but she actually made us, let's look at the video together. And we actually, um, and sort of talked about takeaways, but there were some great points. So didn't want to put you on the spot Anna, if you wanted to go into some of the details on the conversation, but it was a great one. Um, as far as reparations and different things, but I'll defer. Yeah, just I wanted to uh, say that um, 
I found it this um, very fertile ground. We, we talked. I talked about the perspective of teaching English language learners and their, uh, how the Caribbean history is extremely pertinent to them and uh, the institution of slavery as it played out in the Caribbean. Um, and so as I, what, what I decided early on, we had choices that we wouldn't get right into the documents, the written documents, because we would need to build background and context for terms like manumission, petition, that would lock us in. So instead, being very visually oriented and the avenue that videos present us with second language learners, with English language learners, um, I would go right to the video about the royal house. And that was very fertile. And as a person was speaking, the narrator, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name, uh, keywords jumped out at me. What I would want to mention to kids, um, sin. She used that unequivocally, the word sin. Of the sin of slavery, uh, no apologies, reparations, another one, and um, Luce contributed because I couldn't remember, but for example, there is a, there are sections of the Dominican Republic that are particularly a northern city called Samana, uh, where uh, people who escaped from slavery in the U.S. moved, left, settled in Samana. Some of them still have their English names, they kept their English names. So when reparations are being talked about only in the US to the descendants, the direct descendants of families whom we know were enslaved in the US or the institution of slavery was so international, you know? And so those are interesting discussions, but then I would always treat the video from the get-go, urge Essex National Heritage, everybody to do um, from the beginning, transcriptions or subtitles of what the people are saying, because the teacher can then stop, for, if teachers of English language learners can stop and, and um, make comments, almost like a, in, um, I use the, uh, the word telenovela, it's full of drama. It's full of uh, moments, pivotal moments, like why did Belinda Sutton, when she had the chance, she had the chance in the will uh, to get her freedom or continue serving, or continue being part of the household in the royal family. Guess what? She chose freedom. And that you cannot emphasize that enough with, to, to tell this story of resistance, um, quiet and overt, uh, that is very important for the mental health of our students. So there are so many points uh, that videos allow us to make history very compelling and for the kids to reflect. And what's their takeaway? That's a word I taught uh, to my, the, the students who were English language learners doing Caribbean connections. What's, what do you take away from this? Whether it was a story, what's your takeaway? What stays with you? And so those were, that was the angle that we were choosing from the sources, choosing the visual over the written for English language learners, but I think for other students too, because videos are compelling, visual things are compelling. They are. Thank you, Anna. And they're especially compelling when, when supplemented by other sources where we're teaching them to investigate and interrogate all different types of sources. So, so thank you, Anna. Anna. Thank you, um, and Gregory. What about um, group two? Anybody, or I don't have to call on all the groups. So do any of the other groups want to share the kind of things you talked about? or any particular source you found um, especially um, important? I'll start us off, but I, I don't want to have spoken enough and I'll step back um, and maybe invite um, Beth, Tracy, Lauren. We, we had a great um, discussion really thinking about the narrative of the sources, looking at the roof and family, uh, and really were they included within this community? You know, we, op we operated from this notion oftentimes that there's this sense of New England, the North being progressive and inviting, particularly for people of color. And yet, you know, we understand that there's a lot of falsities to that because in many ways, New England is about as exclusive as other areas um, when we think about what side of history folks were on. And so we're, we're talking about this narrative of, you know, a family wanting to fit in in doing the things they can to fit in and be included, but yet the reality is they never can because they're still black, 
and we made an interesting, you know, there's a bit of a juxtaposition um, to the fact that, you know, thinking about barber shops, you know, there's that last source that we wrestled with quite a bit. Um, was that source a source that um, invites white folks, for example, to come to the barber shop, which we know that's not going to happen much like today? The reality is white folks don't go see black doctors nor black dentists um, when we really get down to it. Broad generalization, folks. Keep that in mind. Um, and so, so those are the things we wrestled with, um, thinking about the time frame. But we were, we were stuck on that document and thinking about uh, the narrative of perspective in terms of, of, of how do we teach students that, you know, New England is not the holier than thou inclusive white or, uh, community, though it professes to be this white savior type mentality in this imperialist fashion. I'll step back and, and see if Lauren, Tracy, and Beth may have something to offer as well. Uh, and I know, Beth, you said something really interesting in terms of local to national history with your curriculum. Yeah, I teach high school history, and our curriculum is so based on the national narrative. So I was saying when I'm in this period of time, the middle of the 19th century, we're talking about the Fugitive Slave Act and like how that might impact um, Blacks in the, the North, but I never really dive into local experiences. And so having um, the Rufin family as an example, and also John Greenleaf Whittier came up, like I'm just excited to have these local connections for the same time period to, to complicate the story, right? Um, so yeah, our time ran out, unfortunately. This, this whole morning is going very quickly. It is. Tracy, I see your hand. I'll call you in one second. But I will point out that uh, I think Beth's going to show us in a little bit. Um, there's a whole set of documents, which we didn't give any one group, or just local examples of discrimination. And so there's a source of just as Plessy versus Ferguson being decided uh, in the Supreme Court, this is what's happening in Haverhill, or this is what's happening here. Um, and so one of the big things for my class is that race and racism and these structures of power is not just a Southern story, it's an American story. And think about the kind of, kind of post-revolutionary North in some ways is almost like we talk about reconstructed South. There's advances, but there's also restrictions. There's, there's violence. There's all this stuff that's going on. Um, framing it that way has been helpful, I think, for my students. Um, and Beth, I love that you're trying to make these connections. Um, Tracy, I see your hand. <laughs> Brian was joking earlier about our wait time. Um, Tracy, did you want to join in? Hands down. All right. Um, one other group want to jump in and tell us what you're talking about? Um, so I'll just kick it off, but I defer to uh, my wonderful group, uh, Beth, Catherine, Kate, and Marianne. Uh, we were group four. Um, we were looking at sources largely from Lawrence. Um, there are a couple of, exa of examples from Newburyport, um, sort of about activism within the community. Um, we did talk quite a bit about language. Um, that came up for us quite a bit um, in terms of, you know, what we share, how we contextualize with students um, and, in you know, setting sort of the, the space to talk about language um, and sort of noticing that students are using some terms today without maybe not recognizing the historical significance or power of these words. Um, we also talked about um, ephemera. Um, I mean, I'm a huge history nerd, so I love newspaper clippings and pamphlets. Um, and I think speaking from the Lynn community, there was an example um, from Merriman Mac Valley of the NAACP, they had their 73rd conference um, in 1988, um, and just sort of seeing the, the activism and the resources um, and the, the work that I think is still being done today largely. Um, I you know, said for the Lynn community with our Black History exhibit, um, you know, that that sense of, of holding space for the Black community um, and developing programs around the Black community wasn't really there when I was growing up. So seeing these examples um, of, you know, the Lynn ACP, um, the Community Minority Cultural Center, which is still here in Lynn, um, it was just really eye-opening to see, um, you know, that level of community engagement that existed historically um, and what we can hope to achieve in the future um, in terms of activating our community. I don't know if anybody else in the group wants to chime in. It doesn't appear they do, <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you again, Danica. Uh, so so Beth, I'm looking at the at the agenda and the clock. Um, do you want to start transitioning us into kind of? And I'm seeing questions in the chat about about resources and how we can use these moving forward. 
do you want to remind us about the website and um, tell us what's next? Yes. Um, thank you again, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen quickly to show you that on the website, we have um, some resources for you. In fact, I believe all of these resources that you um, took a look at in the breakout rooms are on the website. We are piggybacking this website onto an earlier workshop that we did also on African American experience in Essex County a little bit earlier time period. So if you go into this tab that says resources, there are a lot of resources there. Um, at this point, we are focusing on workshop five, which is what, you know, the more recent um, sources that many of you were looking at um, just recently right now. And you can see that the sources by theme are included here. I wanted to point out this one that Brad mentioned, local examples of discriminatory practices and resistance. I don't think any of the breakout rooms got to look at these, but there's just some really interesting um, sources for you to check out here that are pretty short. Um, this one in particular, I just think is very interesting, Birth of a Nation Barred from Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, so just if you, if you ever teach about many of us teach about birth of a nation. Um, there is a local connection here with some activists who made sure that that um, film did not get screened in Lynn. Um, I hope you know about the redlined um, maps that are in existence. There's one uh, for Haverhill that, that is an excellent, I, I hope, teaching tool for you. Um, and just some just really interesting stuff. So anyway, those resources are all, all under this resources tab. And again, um, workshop five, but there are also many other um, primary resources from the earlier time periods um, that we did from workshop two. Those are also here. Also, if you wanted, if you didn't get a chance to listen to all of the presentations that um, our speakers uh, so generously recorded for us, those are here. Um, and I also wanted to just give you a couple of notes about PDPs. If you're interested in PDPs, please just go to this tab um, and you will be able to find um, a form that you can fill out to earn 10 PDPs. And basically it's just asking you to think about how you might use some of these sources. Um, so that is the website. And I hope everyone got that link um, Maybe Sherry can stick it in the chat again now, um, if you wouldn't mind. And that way you, you always have that stuff. Somebody asked if the Google Docs will be um, available. Yes, I mean, they're just, they're editable and shared. So if you want to hold on to them, that's great. And you can reference them if you do um, want to do some more work later with them. Um, also, just in closing, wanted to mention that we do have... Um, uh, this opportunity this summer for you, if you, any of teachers who'd like to join us, it's a week long workshop and it's, uh, we're hosting it with the National Park Service. And we've done it for like, I think 11 years now. It's been um, just, it's just a great um, workshop for folks, but it's in person and it's for a week in August. So right now I'm gonna put in the chat, um, the agenda actually, because at the bottom of the agenda, there's just a couple of, links um, that you might want to take a look at. One is that um, workshop, the Park for Every Classroom workshop. There's a flyer for it. Um, we go to different sites all around Essex County and we delve into some of the history, but also we approach it from all disciplines and we're just kind of looking at place as a context for learning. Um, we'll be spending time at a bunch of different um, sites all around the county. So I'd love to have you apply to that if you're interested and it is free. And um, you can uh, also have graduate credit option if you would like that. Also a little stipend too. So there's a flyer about that. And then um, there is a form that we would love for you to just take a couple minutes to fill out. Honestly, it's just to show that you attended this event today that really helps us with our funding. Um, there's a place too, if you have any feedback for us, we'd love to get your feedback um, because we do hope to continue this series. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank you again for joining us. I really took so much out of this um, discussion this morning, and I hope you did too. Um, maybe just a, a closing word from Brian and, and Brad and Sherry. I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, it was a really great uh, discussion today. I, I hope all of you took something from today. Uh, all of the resources from all of the um, different sessions are on that website. So there's all kinds of materials that 
Um, I know I, we would all love all of you to incorporate into your classrooms or, or whatever you're doing. Um, I think there's some great material out there and it really should be utilized in classrooms. So thank you again. Yeah, I, I just say thanks so much. I love learning from, from all of you, um, those who did formal presentations, those who are just sharing your classroom and lived experiences. It's just fantastic. And I appreciate you making the time on a Saturday morning. The only other thing I would say is that um, Salem State, actually, Dr. Bethany Jay is offering a, a summer week-long summer institute on teaching um, African-American history um, using local resources. Um, if you're interested in taking a graduate course on this, um, Dr. Jay is an expert in in 19th century and African American history, um, and would um, it probably be a good experience? So, but so thanks, y'all. Yeah, Sherry, couple words, Sherry. Sure, yes. Thank you all for coming. Um, it, this was a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, I will say that our website is certainly a work in progress. So, if you have resources that you think would be um, useful, please send them along um, to myself or Beth. And we would love to put them up on the website um, and just have those available for, for you to use and just for the future. Great. So with that, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Have a wonderful Mother's Day to all the moms out there and a wonderful weekend, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the work Bye, you everyone. do. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Especially thanks to our guest. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.